Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the BBCA Pest Extra live presentation, the first ever online Pest X technical theatre seminar. So welcome to you all. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay and see me okay. Um, today on our technical theatre, we our first presentation, we have Claire Donald from the University of Glasgow talking to you about novel, novel mosquito control techniques to combat mosquito-borne infections. Uh, just before we get started with the uh, presentation, I just want to do a bit of quick housekeeping with you. This is a new platform that we've used, so just to give you all a bit of guidance. Now, in terms of CPD, um, the pe this Pest Extra event, um, the events team will be tracking your each individual engagement across all of the areas. Uh, for example, presentations you attend, any activity you have across the board, you might be speaking to exhibitors or, or visiting the BPCA team. All of this will be tracked over the course of Pest Extra. And then for each hour that you're active on Pest Extra, we'll give you a, a CPD point. So we can sure that will, will be there. If you have any more questions and after the event, you can always give us a call or an email. Um, for questions, so we have a Q&A section for you to ask questions to the presenter. Um, you'll see an option uh, to click on a Q&A and submit your question button. Now, depending on what you're using, it might be a phone or a tablet, uh, maybe even a laptop. It might be in a different position, but you'll see that Q&A button. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'll read these out to the presenter and we can yeah, answer your questions live and hopefully we can get to all of those. Now, we're very strict on time. Um, so, of course, if I don't manage to get to all of the questions, then, of course, um, if you make a note, you've got a little note section that you can um, jot down some thoughts that you have during the presentation. And again, if we don't get to your questions, please pop them over to the uh, BBCA team after Pest, Pest Extra and we'll try and get them answered for you. Um, all attendees can see the questions asked so if you see a question that you like why not give it a, a thumbs up because this way i can see that if there's a particular question that all of you are really particularly interested in um then i can make sure that that one gets um gets put across to claire um we also have a discussion forum you should see that button there this is just for general chat to all attendees and um we also have a, a bpca moderator that will be keeping an eye um just to see whether or not there's any um any things you're bringing up that they can help you with in terms of technical problems, so if you have any um, sound or video issues, then you just need to hit the orange live support button at the top of your screen. Um, in these live sessions as well, just remind you, we can't hear you or see you. So again, um, the, li the live discussion forums or the Q&A section for any of your specific questions. OK, fabulous. Great. Well, without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Claire Donald from the University of Glasgow to yeah talk about mosquitoes. Claire, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to present to you all this morning. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and I'm very excited. So um, hopefully this will be quite an interesting look at uh, new ways that we can control mosquito populations. Do not need to emphasize to this audience the importance of controlling mosquitoes and their involvement in spreading mosquito transmitted viruses and other pathogens like um, malaria which is a parasite as well as lymphatic filiasis as well and um, they are constantly appearing in the news because they've spread to new areas and reached new populations or in fact, we're seeing emergence of new um, diseases that we've never seen before. So this is really an important area that we need to, to look at in order to control the spread of the mosquito to help combat the spread of these infections. So emergence of these diseases is affected by several different factors, and these are all interlinked. Mosquito transmitted diseases are particularly complex in this regard because not only are they influenced by, by our behaviour, by the host's behaviour, um, but they are, and, and our immune responses as well, but they are affected by vector populations. So the, the vector in this case would be our mosquito. Um, mosquitoes in turn are influenced by our behaviour um, as well as their environment. So when we think about um, global warming, for instance, this has greatly affected the emergence of these infections as warmer and wetter weather allow the mosquitoes to travel to new locations where they could come into contact with naive and susceptible population of host species. Um, whether this is, is humans is particularly important, but, but also other animal populations um, 
as well as those like livestock, for instance, that are um, important for, for, for us, for um, our economy and our health. So indeed, the, if the recent outbreak of the coronavirus, so SARS-CoV-2, um, has highlighted that the disease and, and in, in particular um, virus infections um, are really important when we think about control. So there have been several reports of increasing incidences of mosquito transmitted diseases that have been highlighted because of the coronavirus outbreak. So although we have mitigation strategies in place um, to curtail the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, um, when it's been introduced into so many countries around the world, um, and although these have been really good in averting um, infections of SARS-CoV-2 infections, um, this has been very disruptive for the control of vector-borne diseases such as mosquito-transmitted diseases. Um, so, for instance, distribution of bed nets, for example, in combating malaria um, or the lack of spraying to treat the um, mosquitoes emerging during their breeding seasons. Um, and particularly worrying as well is that modelling studies suggest that in places like sub-Saharan Africa, um, halting these activities can massively increase the burden of mosquito transmitted diseases, such as malaria, which they suspect is going to be double the amount um, of cases in 2021 compared to that of 2019. So um, the pandemic has massively set back our, um, our efforts to control these infections. So if I was to talk about all of the different vectors um, that are involved in spreading mosquito-borne um, diseases, we would be here all day. So I'm just going to mention a few um, specific ones that are relevant within Europe. Um, so when we think about um, mosquito-borne diseases, we often think tropical um, or subtropical areas. However, this is not entirely the case. So for instance, the first vector that I want to mention is Culex pipiens. Um, and this is, is known as the common house mosquito, and it's one of the best known um, species in Europe. And it's found throughout Europe, um, with the exception of Iceland or the Faroe Islands. It's a major vector for um, a virus called West Nile virus, um, which is transmitted primarily among birds, but it can occasionally spill over into human and other animal populations and cause disease. Um, Culex pipins is also involved in the transmission of other viruses, such as Rift Valley fever virus, um, as well as filial worms um, and the plasmodium parasite that causes malaria. Um, these mosquitoes are kind of medium sized, they're between four to 10 uh, millimeters, and they can be distinguished from other species because um, they're brown without any obvious patterns. They've got a rounded abdomen tip, which has like yellow bands on it. Um, the adults are usually found within 500 metres of a breeding site, um, which are frequently man-made um, containers of water. So things like ornamental ponds or water barrels, um, cemeteries, um, water pots in, in cemeteries, for example. Um, and although they do breed in clear water, they can also breed in polluted water as well. Um, and they can tolerate um, small amounts of salinity. So they can be found in coastal regions as well, in like rock pools and, and uh, marshes. Um, and they're particularly a, a significant problem in, in cities where um, there's a, a poor a lack of, of wastewater management. So, for instance, in cities around the Mediterranean basin and also um, further north in, in Europe, in cities where they have problems with treating wastewater, these can be, be a problem. And these mosquitoes can um, breed continuously throughout the season and produce multiple generations per year, um, depending upon the climatic conditions. So this can significantly impact um, their ability to transmit diseases. Um, the next genus that I want to mention is Anopheles, and there are several different uh, types or several different species of, of Anopheles that live in Europe. All of these different species are important vectors for transmission of malaria. Um, and although malaria has been eradicated in Europe since the 1970s um, and the risk um, is quite low, it could be that imported cases um, into regions where these populations um, are found could lead to infections of um, malaria, local infections. 
So depending on the particular species, these are found distributed throughout the whole of Europe. Um, Anopheles atribus, for example, um, is quite commonly found in England. Um, and they're often very difficult to distinguish um, from other related or closely related species in the adult stage. And you have to, to compare the eggs in order to make a, um, a good identification. Again, depending on the species, um, their breeding sites will vary. So some prefer brackish water um, and other species such as um, Anopheles plumbus utilize artificial breeding sites, which allow them to become really adapted to, um, to urban environments. Um, those that are, are distributed to more temperate parts of Europe often um, semi-hibernate, so when the temperatures drop below about 10 degrees Celsius, um, it allows them to semi-hibernate, so they will move indoors to get shelter um, and wait until favourable conditions, uh, conditions return so that they can uh, re-emerge. Um, and although um, many of them have quite a wide host range, they, they are highly adapted to feeding on humans um, and can be quite aggressive as well. Uh, the final two species that I want to talk about are, are really quite um, significant baddies when we think about spreading um, mosquito transmitted diseases. And this is um, Aedes aegypti, or the yellow fever mosquito, um, and also Aedes aldopictus, which are um, the which is commonly called the, the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, both are significant vectors for the spread of a number of different viruses. So for instance, dengue, um, chikungunya, and Zika. Both of these um, mosquitoes are quite small. Um, they are quite distinctive because of their black and white pattern. And they've got white um, or silver scales um, on a kind of black background. They can be easily confused with each other, um, but you can see that Aedes aldopictus has this single stripe um, on the dorsal area of its uh, thorax, which allows it to be distinguished from Aedes aldopictus, um, Aedes aegypti, sorry, um, because it has the, the kind of shape of a lyra on, the, on, the, on its back, so um, a bit more kind of decorative. Um, Aedes aegypti are, are very highly domesticated. They, they love uh, people um, and they don't um, fly particularly far away. They're usually found within 100 metres of a, a good feeding ground. Um, so they thrive in really densely populated areas, um, particularly those that have unreliable water supplies or waste management or sanitation um, facilities. Um, they will actively choose to feed on humans um, rather than feeding on um, feeding on an alternative hosts and they feed during the day which means that um, bed nets are um, not applicable to defending against this species. Um, Aedes aldopictus are less well domesticated um, and have a variety of different um, host species that they would feed on. They're more forest dwelling and prefer to lay their eggs in more natural um, water containers. Um, they are referred to as what we call a secondary vector, which means that if they are found in a region where Aedes um, aegypti are also found, they will be um, a slightly less of an issue compared to Aedes aegypti. Um, however, um, when they are found in regions on their own, they are a significant threat to the spread of mosquito transmitted diseases. Um, they are, um, because Aedes aldopictus, their eggs can survive being dried. And so they can survive in more temperate regions compared to Aedes aegypti, um, which makes them um, a significant threat within Europe. Um, both are able to feed multiple times um, during their, their uh, life cycle, and they will produce multiple generations within one uh, mosquito breeding season. Um, so this is a, a global map showing the, the distribution of both Aedes aegypti and Aedes aldopictus. Um, Aedes aegypti is one of the most widespread um, mosquito species globally. Um, historically, it was um, only found in Africa. However, trade vessels and uh, in particular the slave trade caused it to emerge out of Africa and was um, distributed to other countries along with African slaves. Um, its current distribution um, in Europe specifically is quite limited, but it is spreading. Um, it's more limited because um, it's intolerant to the, the more temperate regions um, and its eggs will die if they are exposed to frost. However, there are still parts of Europe, for example, around the, the Mediterranean, um, where ample um, 
suitable habitats can be found to, to support their life cycle. Um, Aedes aldopictus has been classed as one of the top 100 invasive species um, by the, the, the invasive species uh, specialist group um, and it will very happily live in Europe and you can find it in Italy, Greece, Spain um, and Germany for example. Um, it's been involved in the local transmission of chikungunya virus um, in Italy and France as well as transmission of dengue um, within, Fran uh, within France and Croatia. Um, so this really highlights the importance of, of monitoring and controlling these species within, within Europe. Um, Aedes aldopictus, um, as I've said, is able to, to survive more mild winters. Um, so in areas where the temperatures stay above, above freezing, eggs are able to overwinter um, and it needs a, an average annual temperature of about 11 degrees to support adult survival as well as at least 500 uh, millimetres of annual rainfall. Um, however, there are reports that they are becoming more adapted to, to lower annual mean temperatures, which can go as low as five degrees, um, and they can survive in, in areas where rainfall is only about 300 uh, millimetres annually. So although it is not clear um, how significant Aedes aldopictus is for disease transmission um, across Europe, their ability to adapt to these new environments um, will enhance its ability to, to, to settle within Europe um, and it could confirm its involvement in disease transmission cycles, which makes surveillance um, and control of this species so important. The spread of these species is also not helped by the lack of effective control mechanisms that we have against them and coupled with that the worry of, of climate change um, and human activity as well. It's believed that they, this is going to help expand their distribution um, and with that the diseases that they carry. <coughs> So this is the, the mosquito life cycle. Um, only the females uh, feed on blood, um, and that is because they need the protein within uh, the blood to produce their eggs. These eggs are then laid into water, so this is the start of their aquatic life cycle. Um, Kulik species will lay a raft of, of eggs, however, um, Anopheles and Aedes tend to lay individual eggs. Um, and usually these will hatch within about 48 hours if, if they're still wet. Um, the larvae are aquatic and they will, um, they will molt uh, three times and get larger with each shedding. Um, they're highly active, um, they breathe um, from the surface of the water and they um, respond to, uh, to light and uh, they feed on organic matter and microorganisms that are found in that water source. Um, the final um, larval stage will metamorphosize into a pupae. And the pupil stage is a, a non-feeding stage, although they still need to breathe um, and they respond to light as well. So they will move away from potential sources of danger or move up to the surface of the, of the water to breathe. Um, and the adult mosquito will emerge from the pupae rest for a short time on the, on the surface of the water while it dries out and um, before it flies away. Um, males tend to emerge first and they will wait on the, um, in the surrounding areas for the females to emerge so that they can mate as soon as those females emerge. Um, however, many um, the environmental factors at the time will depend, um, will influence how long each of these stages take. Um, so things like temperature. Um, and I've also mentioned that, that several of the species that are key to disease, disease transmission will have multiple generations each year. So there will be a constant new supply of individuals um, that are produced within one season to help spread um, the disease. So the first thing that, that many of us will, will think about when we think about mosquito control is the use of uh, personal mosquito repellents. And, and there's a huge number of these available um, from aerosol sprays, lotions, candles, um, ultrasound devices, lamps, stickers, wristbands, etc. Um, mosquitoes are attracted to us because of the, the lactic acid that is present in our sweat, um, as well as the CO2 that we breathe out. And these are detected by the chemoceptors um, that are present on the mosquito's antenna. And the idea behind many repellents is to mask the, the scent of these um, chemo, um, um, uh, chemicals. So DEET in particular um, is a really widely used um, mosquito repellent, um, as well as IR3535. Um, however, the use of these synthetic repellents can lead to resistance 
within mosquitoes, um, as well as potentially having harmful um, negative effects to non-target insect species, um, and it's a threat to the, the environment. Um, so there are discussions around the use of these particular chemicals. Um, we can get bio-based um, repellents, which are marketed as safer alternatives. Uh, they contain biologically active ingredients that are derived from, from plants or uh, fungi or bacteria. Um, and they can be used particularly in sensitive areas um, where pot potentially there's endemic mosquito resistance um, and environmental concerns that, that lead to the limitation of the use of, of specific chemicals. Um, another approach is embedding nanoparticles uh, within cotton fabrics, and this generates um, insect repellent clothing. And these have been shown to be quite, um, they're eco-friendly and have quite a high efficiency um, and can be quite long lasting. Um, so alternatively, public health strategies have uh, focused a lot on decreasing human and vector contact. Um, so this can involve the use of um, adult sites, um, either alone or in combination with the elimination of different breeding sites. Um, so eradication programmes by and large have been rather unsuccessful um, and unsustainable um, for, for many different reasons. They're, they're, they're very complex. They, um, difficult to, to implement a proper program, they might have ineffective coverage um, and they might not be able to scale up um, as required. They also require significant input um, in terms of human um, activity as well as financial um, input as well. One um, major example would be uh, the use of DDT. The DDT was used um, really heavily during World War II um, and it led to the eradication of Aedes aegypti from 22 different um, countries within the Americas. However, um, as soon as the as DDT was was banned, um, mosquitoes were were readily able to re-establish themselves. Um, DDT was used um, because it was cheap and it was very effective. Um, however, we now know that it bioaccumulates within the within the environment, so it builds up within organisms and within the environment. So um, this can lead to toxicity, birth defects, um, reproductive issues um, within a variety of of different species. So um, there are many uh, chemical insecticides that can be used against, um, against adult mosquitoes. Um, however, these are not specific and will have an impact on other, um, other species. Um, and in addition, adult um, populations will recover um, very quickly once these programs have, uh, have ceased. So it's best to kind of target these during outbreak seasons in order to kill the infected mosquitoes and minimise environmental um, impacts. Um, if you're regularly using uh, chemical insecticides, um, it's a really good idea to, to follow up with quality um, control inspections so you can assess how effective these chemicals are um, on controlling the target population um, and to also monitor for um, insecticide resistance to the, the active substance that's being used. Um, and this will help prevent um, insecticide resistance um, within those populations. Um, source reduction um, is another way that we can control um, mosquito populations and it's, um, it involves the elimination of the, the mosquito's breeding sites. Um, this is also an effective and long-term solution um, and um, locals uh, quite like it because it means that there's, there's less mosquitoes around uh, to bite. Um, However, it is very difficult to manage because um, breeding sites can be um, any everywhere depending on the, the mosquito that's involved. So it could be anything from, from swamps or salt marshes to drains or um, unused uh, plant, uh, plant pots or, or tires. So this is not a, a straightforward um, fix. Um, and it's a really good idea to have uh, the input from, from local people as well as the, the local authorities, because if you leave a small area untouched, this is enough to, to maintain a mosquito population within an area. Um, breeding sites are often very difficult to, to track and eliminate, for example, if they're um, tree holes um, and natural um, water containers. Um, and so mosquitoes around the home can be really easily um, maintained and reduced if you remove the water sources from, from around the garden. So it's a really good idea to encourage residents to do this quite regularly during mosquito seasons. 
Um, so one of the earliest methods that was used to control mosquitoes around uh, 1812 um, was treating um, mosquito infected waters with kerosene. Um, over the years, this has been more refined um, and improved, but larval control is still a major way that we can we can control um, mosquitoes. Um, and it can involve either chemicals or microbial larvicides um, or into growth regulators um, and either bacterial toxins applied um, from the ground or through aerial applications. Um, controlling aquatic life stages is often preferable because they are relatively immobile and um, it's concentrated within a specific area and it's, it's less, you know, the adults are more widely dispersed um, than, than larvae. Um, so it does, however, have um, require quite a good understanding of the local populations and um, just so that you know their, their seasonal abundance and their preferred habitats. Um, and it can be quite difficult to treat, um, for instance, if the mosquitoes are, are breeding in an economically important area, like a rice field or a wetland uh, that can't be drained, for example. Um, you can use like short-lived uh, surface oils that can be useful um, in areas that are environmentally sen uh, sensitive. So what they do is they um, reduce the surface tension of the water and make it difficult for the, the larvae to breed um, or for the, the adult mosquitoes to emerge um, and it causes them to drown. So this is, is quite effective when it's applied correctly. Uh, Insect growth uh, regulators can be used to um, prevent the normal um, maturation process of, of, um, of the mosquitoes and um, they're often um, considered to be environmentally safer um, and an alternative to, to, to chemicals. Um, other examples would include uh, microbial insecticides um, or, or bioinsecticides, and these have been developed to be specific to their target organisms um, and can be um, used to, to very specific um, orders of mosquito or of, of insects. Um, for instance, uh, BTI um, produces a crystalline uh, protoxin when it spores. Um, and when these are released into the water, the larvae are able to um, ingest them via filter feeding. Um, and essentially these protoxins are, are, are non-toxic um, until they're ingested by the larvae and they, they reach the midgut. Um, when they're in the midgut, they, um, they attack the lining of the midgut um, and this causes the, the, um, the cells to, to swell. It means that the larvae will stop feeding and, and they usually die within uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, LSPH is, is, is quite similar, it acts in a very similar way. Um, however, it persists in the environment for a bit longer um, and it releases um, its toxins from, from dead larvae. So it means that it's, um, it uh, recycles the toxins um, within the environment. Um, and there's been quite a lot of literature that has shown that there, there's um, a lot of formulations that can be used that um, delay or prevent resistance. Um, for specifically when, when we think about malaria, um, the use of um, long lasting insecticidal uh, nets and spraying can massively reduce the burden of, of malaria. Um, they um, are quite useful. So as I've said, um, malarial transmitting mosquitoes um, quite often feed in the evening or at night time. So the use of a bed net can be can be very effective. Um, however, we, we have used these against Aedes aegypti um, and Aedes aldopictus mosquitoes. Um, indoor spraying, for example, can be used on surfaces within, within homes or within buildings where these mosquitoes will rest after they've, um, they've had a blood meal. And so this is quite um, a useful way to be able to control um, mosquito populations within, within um, domestic settings. Um, these uh, space that's there, they can be more um, effective than just spraying normal normal spaces. However, um, it does require training um, for people to be able to do these, and it's often a good idea to 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 vary the different combinations or the different treatments that are involved um, because um, this prevents resistance being being developed. Now, quite a lot of these um, these technologies that I've mentioned so far um, are quite general, so they will pick up um, a number of different different um, species without being um, particularly um, um, 
specific. Um, however, for um, very specific advances towards individual species, we have um, now have a, a much broader array of different tools and technologies that we can use to be really specific about the, the species that we target. So, for instance, we now have the genome sequences available for a wide number of different major um, mosquito vector species. Um, so the first one was the Anopheles gambiae, which is a, a major vector for malaria transmission in, in Africa, and its genome was sequenced as far back as 2002. And since then, we have now got the sequences for a variety of other species. Um, and as you can see with, with the Aedes aegypti, for example, we've even gone back and, and done further versions of it to, to fill in the gaps that we weren't able to pick up the first, uh, the first time around. And so this is really good at... Um, allowing us to do very targeted um, alterations to the genome to be able to produce mosquitoes that, that are um, less susceptible to carrying the virus. Um, and this can reduce the ability of these species to uh, transmit the virus um, to um, when they feed. So um, we would class this as a genetic modification. So the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, defines this as um, the, the use or, or of any condition or treatment that can reduce the reproductive potential um, of noxious forms of the mosquito by altering or replacing the, the heredity um, material. Um, and so this is something that, that we would use in order to, in, in, within two broad categories. So we can either use it to um, suppress a population um, or to modify this mosquito po or mosquito populations. Um, and this involves like replacing the existing wild populations of mosquitoes with strains um, that have been been altered so that they um, they are less susceptible to um, either being infected or spreading um, the disease. So although the, the preferred method has traditionally been um, population suppression, uh, there is the risk that these uh, niches would then become available to other um, other species and they could be filled by by something that, that is um, that is worse. Um, so some examples of um, genetic modification within mosquitoes would include um, the sterile insect technique um, or SIT, and this involves mass rearing your target um, species um, and sterilizing them using um, radiation or uh, chemo sterilants um, and then releasing them into, into the environment. Um, and so what this does is basically the, 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 um, the mosquitoes, they're, they're usually male um, and when they're released into the, the, um, the environment, they mate with wild populations of females um, and the, the offspring are not able to, um, to develop. Um, and so the population becomes suppressed. So SIT is really effective um, and it's very economical um, when you're able to, to mass produce um, a lot of males. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, it's very useful because the, the, um, the females will, will, won't be able to produce any offspring. So you have a, a, an immediate reduction in the amount of, of pest populations that are in that, in, in that environment. It's been used very successfully for other species like moths and flies and beetles. Um, it's environmentally friendly um, and it doesn't release um, any, um, it wouldn't have any off target effects to other species because there's no foreign material that's uh, available to be released into, um, into the environment. Um, another example would be the release of insects carrying um, a dominant lethal gene. Um, particularly this um, has been developed by um, the Oxford based company Oxitec um, and they've had very successful trials in Brazil um, as well as other previous trials um, in other countries. Um, and so again, it involves the, the release of, um, well, it involves rearing about 4 million mosquitoes in a week. Um, and they have additional genes inserted into their, their DNA. Um, and this gene encodes for a protein that drives the expression of other genes. Um, and basically it causes genetic chaos within the mosquito. They're, they're unable to produce the, the proteins that they need uh, to be able to survive. And, and essentially um, it, it, it messes up their, their, um, their own biology and, and the offspring will die. So the, the modified male mosquitoes are, are released. They, they reproduce with wild uh, females um, and all of the offspring will then inherit um, a copy of, of the gene. Um, and it's a self-limiting gene. 
um, which means that, that after the, the, the release is stopped, the genes do not persist within the environment. Um, however, it is possible to turn these genes off. So when they're rearing the mosquitoes, um, you can treat them with tetracycline, which allows you to produce um, all of these um, mosquitoes that are then available to be released um, into the populations. Um, another thing that the Oxitec have included is a, is a fluorescent gene um, into their um, into their mosquitoes, so that you're, it's really easy with the with the correct equipment to be able to to look at um, which mosquitoes are are modified compared to wild mosquitoes. So this allows um, allows researchers to be able to track the success of these um, of this technique, this tool um, within within the field um, in real time. So you can you can see how effective it is. And um, some of the trials have produced about 90, 85 to 90 percent uh, success rates. Um, and then the final thing that I just uh, just want to mention really quickly, because I'm aware that I'm, I'm rapidly running out of time, um, is the use of Wolbachia. So Wolbachia um, is, a, is a very common bacteria. It's found in about 65% of all insect species. However, importantly, it's not found within Aedes aegypti. And there are quite a few um, uh, programs at the moment that are um, looking at the use of Wolbachia um, within Aedes aegypti to control dengue specifically. So what you can do is you can artificially introduce um, Wolbachia within um, Aedes aegypti populations um, and the, the Wolbachia in, in, in inhibits the ability of viruses to be able to replicate within the, the mosquito and so they're, they're not able to be spread um, by the mosquito when it, when it takes another blood meal. Um, these bacteria live within the, the mosquito cells and they're able to be passed um, from one generation to another within, within the mosquito, um, mosquito eggs. Um, it has a lot of benefits. Um, it's, um, Wolbachia is able to manipulate the host, um, specifically the reproductive system, um, to ensure that, that the eggs um, have or are carrying the Wolbachia. So for instance, if you have a, a male mosquito that has Wolbachia and it mates with a, a female that doesn't have Wolbachia, um, then the eggs that she lays will not hatch. Um, this is um, this is also the case. Um, so, if you have a, a male and a female that both carry Wolbachia, um, then then the eggs will hatch. But the the result is that the number of, of individuals carrying Wolbachia massively increases um, rapidly until all of the 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 mosquitoes in that population um, are carrying it. So that means that it's really easily um, maintained within the population um, and can. Um, persist. So even after you've, you've stopped your releases of the mosquitoes that carry the Wolbachia, um, it's able to, to be self-sustaining and, and um, can carry itself within, within the population. So there's, there's a massive drive um, to develop new and, and, and novel techniques that we can use to be able to, um, to effectively combat mosquitoes. The, these kind of infections are, are unique because they, they involve not only a, a host species, a mammalian host, um, but also the, the mosquitoes. So there's a, a very complex relationship between um, mosquito-borne born infections um, and the vector as well as as well as the host. So um, there's a, a, a lack of effective um, vaccines and, and therapies that are available at the moment to be able to to um, to treat these these infections. And so um, using vector control strategies, effective effective uh, vector control strategies that are um, environmentally friendly and, and cost effective are really the, the way forward to be able to, to, to control these these infections. Um, and with that, I'd like to, to finish and I'm happy to, to take any questions that you that you have. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Claire? Great. Good stuff. Yes, Thank I can. Hi. Excellent. We've got a couple of extra minutes to be able to do some questions. So just to the um, everybody here, the attendees, we're probably going to get to a couple of them. I know there's about seven or eight that have come through. So again, if you note down any questions you've got, and if we don't get to them, you can put them over to us afterward, and hopefully, Claire, we can get them out to you. Okay. Um, fantastic. So yeah. um, the one that's been voted for the most, um, the question is, are the numbers of mis mosquitoes in the UK capable of transmitting these infectious diseases going to increase substantially over the next five years due to global warming and enhanced transport networks and things like that? 
Yeah, this, this is something that is definitely a, a, a real concern. Um, as I've mentioned, some of those, uh, you know, particularly the, the Anopheles mosquitoes are found within um, within England. So they're, they're very local um, and with, well, obviously not at the moment. We haven't had a particularly large amount of travel. Um, but in the future, if there's increasing um, transmission or, or movement of people and travel and, and, and trade, then, um, yeah, this is absolutely a, a risk that these infections could could happen um with, with within Europe within the UK right. absolutely or maybe not so so great but, uh, wrong word there, but, <laughs> right I've got another one we've got a minute or just over a minute left so um I will um go on to that so in terms of den fever in the UK how prevalent is it so within the UK, we haven't had any um, any cases of dengue within within the UK, but it is creeping ever closer. We we have seen in cases of it within Europe. So these are not distant distant infections that that are only an issue if we go on holiday. It could be something that that will affect us potentially in the future, especially as these these mosquitoes are able to to find new areas within. Um, within new habitats that they're that they're able to occupy quite happily so yeah definitely a drive towards controlling them effectively is is something that should be a very much a concern at the right. moment thank you claire so sorry that's all the time we have for the questions that was an excellent presentation and i, I thank you so much and also all of the attendees and all have a, a fantastic rest of your day thank you all right take care thank you so much thanks